Hello, and welcome to another edition of Critical Q&A, the show where I answer your questions based on what you've left for me in the comments section of my Q&A videos or have sent to me by email at askchrisshelton at gmail.com. Okay, tis the season. We are in the mood for holiday spirits and surprises and all of that fun. This is our Christmas edition of the Critical Q&A show for this year, 2018. And I have no Christmas-specific questions for you, but, <laughs> um, but we do have some good questions to take up. And I also want to um, put out there that I did this podcast this week on the subject of free speech. I did, it's a very, very important subject to me. As a content creator right now, there's a lot of sensitive sensitivity out there on free speech and what is allowed, what's not allowed, uh, what, is our, what are our rights in regards to all of this. So I talked about this, did some, did some research on it, then I talked about it. And uh, I think I put a fairly decent podcast together, and, uh, and I'd appreciate it if you guys would check it out and give me your feedback on that. So that all being said, now let's get on with your questions uh, for this week. Kimberly Roth, I went on to the official Scientology website, and it said that there's a mission about a mile away from my house. But when I asked for the closest org to me, it said the org in Miami, an hour away, is closest. What is the difference between an org and a mission? Also, I called the number listed on their website for the mission near me, and it was disconnected. So a few days later, I drove to the mission. It is an old ruin of a small office building. It's completely empty, with a huge for lease sign out front. What is going on? Why list this mission on their website at all if it doesn't actually exist? Okay, Kimberly, so I did a whole video, which I'm going to link to below, called Scientology's Organizational Madness, which breaks down the entire Scientology organizational structure and how it is uh, organized and how it's run. So please do check that out. But for your question, I will tell you right now that a Scientology mission is a local group that uh, is run by an individual called a mission holder who purchases a package of materials from the Church of Scientology along with a license to be able to deliver Dianetics and Scientology uh, services up to a certain level and sell Dianetics and Scientology materials. So uh, basically it's like a mission similar to the old Christian missions, I guess, uh, or Catholic missions or something. Uh, like I think of the missions along the coast of California, like those kind of missions. Um, I think is where it derives its name from within the Scientology context. It's a, it's a field group that uh, is not an official um, I, I guess I want to say certified, you know, sub-organization of the Church of Scientology International. It's a, it's a bit of a looser relationship. They used to be called franchises. So that might give you a clue as to what it's all about. An individual has sold the right to deliver Scientology services, only so many of them, only certain ones. Certain courses can be offered there and auditing services up to the level of clear can be offered at a mission. Nothing else. You can't do auditor training at a mission or advanced training, and you're certainly never going to do anything like the upper OT levels or anything confidential. Missions are very low level. They're meant to be spearheads into society for Scientology, with uh, lots of books being sold is the, is the first thing that a mission is supposed to be doing, and delivering introductory level services and lower level services that get people kind of interested and hotted up on Scientology. And then the mission is supposed to direct the person to go to an org, whatever the closest org is to their geographical area. So in your case, it would have been Miami. Uh, in my case, it would be Denver org, because I live here in Denver. Um, mission, every org is supposed to have about 10 missions around it but very, very few of them have even one or two missions. Um, missions spring up and disappear just like, you know, like will-o'-wisps. There's a night and, you know, they're up one day, they're gone the next. That's why the databases within Scientology International's list of all the missions changes. It fluctuates all the time, and they're not really so great at keeping up on it. Missions have, there's a long history to missions in Scientology going back to when they first started back in the 60s and maybe even in the 50s. And uh, 
um, Hubbard basically took actions in the early 1980s that destroyed the mission network, which had been built up through the 1970s, to an impressive level. I mean, there were missions all over the place, and some of these missions had actually grown to be larger than the orgs. Hubbard didn't like that, and neither did the Sea Org, and they were down on that, so they kind of basically annihilated the mission network. And ever since the early 1980s, the mission network has never really built back up to the level that it used to be at, and hasn't even come close. Um, Scientology puts all of its stock in its orgs, and now, more recently, I'd say over the last you know, 20 years or so, even the orgs are being neglected, and it's really only the Sea Org delivery installations, the Sea Org delivery orgs, that get most of the attention from Scientology management and from David Miscavige. Um, orgs are official Scientology churches, missions are not. So an org has religious status, I think missions do too, but, um, but orgs are official churches and they are able to deliver all Scientology courses up to what's called a class five auditor training level, which is why orgs are called class five orgs. That's their official title. We just call them orgs, you know, for short for organizations. But officially in Scientology, they're called class five organizations. And they also audit up to the level of clear. Orgs don't deliver confidential services either, not the upper level services. There are a couple services orgs can deliver that are considered confidential, like when a person gets to the level of clear and says, hey, I'm clear, there's an action they do called the clear certainty rundown, which verifies that they're clear. Or, orgs are uh, authorized to deliver the clear certainty rundown. But after that's done and the guy has been validated as a clear, he's supposed to be sent by the org up to the C org, uh, service orgs, to do his advanced level services. A mission could take somebody up to clear, but they're not going to deliver a, a clear certainty rundown at a mission. That requires an org staff, minimally. Um, most of the time, because most orgs don't deliver the clear certainty rundown either because they don't have the personnel trained for it, they send people on up to the C org orgs for that. The missions do too. Not every mission is firmly attached to its local org. Some of them are more attached to the Sea Org orgs. It's all kind of the bureaucracy and politics of Scientology, so I don't need to get into all the details and, uh, of all of that and the minutia of it. I'm trying to give the, the more broad strokes here. A mission will close if the mission holder who bought the, pa the package of materials and the rights to deliver these services decides that he can't afford to do this anymore, he's not making money doing it, uh, he gets interested in other things, he, you know, says, ah, oh, Scientology is not really, you know, for me anymore. Um, that's, you know, kind of rare, but it happens. Um, but missions close as a result of insolvency or unviability all the time. Because it's really up to the mission holder and who he hires and whether they're going to make some money to pay their staff. I mean, it's really, it's, it's kind of a Scientology startup, you know. And, uh, and the only guidelines they really have as to how to succeed is instructions and, and uh, guidelines on how to sell books, how to put on local events, and how to, you know, get people in. And um, I think, uh, oh, and then, of course, how to, you know, deliver the services. So with Scientology's incredibly toxic uh, PR at this point, Missions are, you know, uh, kind of, the, they're supposed to be, like I said, the entry line into getting people into Scientology. But, you know, you can imagine these little part-time activities. I mean, missions are very rarely a full-time operation. They can't really afford to be. Most of them don't make that much money. That's why they, they fold so quickly. Um, but if they do start getting going, you know, they can get bigger. But, um, but most of them, like I said, just kind of fall apart pretty quickly. So... That's the deal with missions versus orgs. And again, watch that video that I referenced to you at the beginning because that really explains all of this stuff and the whole hierarchy of, of all this terminology. There's a lot, of, a lot of terminology in Scientology and you just kind of have to learn it as you go. So, um, so I hope you'll check that out. Jim Watson, if you have heard of and listened to Jordan Peterson, what are your thoughts on him and his positions as related to gender roles? Do you feel that he is a critical thinker or biased trying to rationalize his views? Thanks for the question, Jim. Um, Jordan Peterson is a complicated issue. Uh, he's a complicated man. 
there is a lot of controversy around that man. And I, my position on him is, you know, nuanced. Um, because he's not a black and white, he's not the kind of guy who uh, it lends himself to memes or short statements. He, he, he talks a lot. Um, I mean, I talk a lot, and he impresses me at how much he talks a lot. I mean, he's really something. Um, and he doesn't always get right to his point. He's a, he's a clinical psychologist, and on the subject of clinical psychology or dealing with, you know, mental issues, mental illnesses, things like that, when he talks about that, he's on solid ground. And I have found his, um, his commentary and his talks about when he talks about that to be the most interesting thing I, I, I think he talks about. He is famous for taking a stand on free speech in Canada and then starting to talk about his political positions. And he refers to cultural Marxism and, you know, the, the postmodernism. He throws a lot of words around and, and these words and their meanings are, are kind of, you know, convoluted and, and difficult to understand because different people use them different ways, okay? And, um, and so you got to listen to the guy for a long time to kind of get around what is he talking about when he's talking about politics. He's not, he's not a simplistic speaker like a Rush Limbaugh or an Alex Jones. He's, 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 he's layered and he's complicated and he's an incredibly intelligent person. That's not to say that he's come to really intelligent conclusions, though. Um, there's lots of things that Jordan Peterson talks about that I don't particularly agree with. I do agree with his position regarding personal responsibility. Um, I agree with his positions regarding uh, the silencing or, or squelching of free speech by the left, uh, the extreme left, I should say, which I talked about in my podcast this week. Um, and I have been fascinated, absolutely fascinated, by, his, um, by, by what he talks about when he gets into... Um, Jungian archetypes and religion. And it's, and it's only because of its novelty. It's such an interesting point of view he has about stories and narratives and their place in society and how they shape our beliefs. I was, I will say this, I was intellectually stimulated by what he was saying, okay? It got me thinking, in other words. I wasn't I don't particularly agree with all the things that he's saying about that, but I found the framing of that model of, of, of archetypes and, and you know, uh, hero, the, like hero narratives, the hero's journey, these various things compared to and contrasted with biblical narratives or religious narratives or stories in general, I, I found, and, and how that shapes our thinking, I found that to be very, very interesting. And I think that that is more aligned with his psychology degree and his, and his work in that field. And that's why, again, I think he's on more solid ground with that than, say, his politics. I, I, you know, I'm not going to get into his politics because I don't, I don't totally understand them. He's, he doesn't make himself clear in certain areas. One of the areas he's really, really difficult to pin down is what are his religious views personally? He's not clear on it. I think he said he's Christian, but and then one of the other things that he is not really crystal clear about, at least not that I've heard, and I've, I've listened to about 15 to 20 hours of his interviews and podcasts with Joe Rogan, Russell Brand, Sam Harris, um, you know, interviews he's done with media. So I, I feel I've, you know, I listened to what he had to say long enough to, to figure out what he was about. Um, but also to see that he's that there are some things he's not willing to really be open about. And I thought the um, transgender issue, for example, is something he's not really crystal clear about, at least not in what I saw. But again, you know, I, I kind of gave up on, on, on watching him after a certain point. Um, and uh, I, so I can't really speak to what he talks about in terms of, you know, you're, you asked me about his positions as related to gender roles. Um, I, I, I couldn't really speak in, you know, about or to that very much. I can speak to the psychology stuff. That was the stuff I was most interested in that he had to talk about. Um, the other stuff was interesting, but I really just kind of felt like it was just kind of his opinions about things. I think when it comes to him, I'm rather ambivalent. So, and as I'm sure you can tell from the way I've been answering this question. So uh, that's what I have to say about the guy. And, um, and there you go. Ross Geringer. As a fun thought experiment, what do you think would be the first things 
LRH would do if he walked into a Scientology church tomorrow and was somehow authenticated? Use R245 on Miscavige immediately for his squirrel changes to the tech? Uh, probably. I think, I think L. Ron Hubbard would be furious at David Miscavige for the massive numbers of changes that he has made to Scientology's materials, and more importantly, how he has brought complete disgrace upon the Scientology brand through his utter incompetence and ineptitude. David Miscavige is one of the worst administrators and leaders you could possibly, you know, ever want to have anything to do with. And while Hubbard was going, you know, rather senile and, and wackadoo in his later years, uh, he and Mary Sue, together, not individually, together, he and Mary Sue built up the Church of Scientology into a, a you know, a fairly large and certainly prosperous organization in its heyday. And it was on track to keep going, but um, Miscavige got in the mix, and Hubbard started going crazy, and I mean literally, you know, losing his marbles, and started taking actions like destroying the Mission Network. That was a huge, gigantic mistake uh, on both of their parts. And of course, uh, you know, Hubbard ended up in seclusion and died, and Miscavige took over. So uh, Hubbard would not be happy at all. In fact, if we understand things properly according to Jesse Prince's narratives, um, David Miscavige's head was on the chopping block at near the end of uh, Hubbard's life in about 1985 or so, because um, Hubbard died in 86. Um, Jesse Prince was, was interrogating David Miscavige, security checking him for, on L. Ron Hubbard's orders. And though reports from those security checks never made it to Hubbard, and that was one of the reasons that Miscavige skated and got out of um, a, a huge viper's nest of trouble he was he had put himself into. So uh, so he barely you know skated by the hair of his chinny chin chin. Uh, in and you know if he and Pat Broker had not been working in collusion uh, to keep those those that information from L. Ron Hubbard. Scientology would be extremely different these days, <laughs> really different. Not necessarily better, just different. Uh, so, anyway, Hubbard would definitely scapegoat Miscavige in a microsecond for all of his failure to expand Scientology and to and for his uh, ruination of Gold Base and Int management and the destruction of the entire structure of Scientology. Again, as I laid out in the video, Scientology's Organizational Madness, so you can check that video out also if you want to know what I'm talking about with all of that. Um, and I think that's how he would deal with things. He, to the public, Hubbard would probably uh, put some kind of project together. He would probably um, put some kind of uh, issue together, apologizing for all of the uh, issues and problems with Scientology over the years. I'm sure he would issue some kind of amnesty or something for people like me to try to get us back, which wouldn't work, but at least he would, I'm sure, pretty sure he would try. If Hubbard was feeling in his beneficent side of his personality, right? Hubbard had, you know, kind of multiple personalities and ways of dealing with things. But I'm giving Hubbard all the benefit of the doubt here that he's looking at things clearly and uh, and, and from a position of mental competence, which was not his mental state at the end of his life, but, you know, earlier in his life it was. So, um, and of course, Hubbard being Hubbard, he would, you know, blame everybody else and he would, uh, you know, put his policies back in force, you know, as they were originally written and he would take out Miscavige's alterations and all of that. So there would be a very, very interesting resurgence in interest in Scientology if something like that were to happen. I mean, something like that just couldn't help but get out into the public. And if somebody was claiming they were L. Ron Hubbard reincarnated, oh man, can you imagine? Anyway, I'm probably going beyond the bounds of your question here, but uh, those are the things I think Hubbard would do in a, in a fairly straightforward manner if he came back. Susan Hepler. On the AMA Reddit session at the end of season one, Mike Rinder mentioned how he had reviewed the script for Pulp Fiction and actually advised John Travolta not to take the role. Has the church ever expressly forbidden one of its celebrities to take a certain role due to concerns about how that role is going to be portrayed? What kind of mental gymnastics does the church do when one of its celebrities takes a role playing a character that they would consider suppressive? It's a good question, Susan. I'm not really sure. I've never heard of any Scientology celebrities who were flat out told, 
you can't take this role because we disagree with it. I mean, even Mike said, well, I don't recommend that you take this role, John. But John Travolta went ahead and did it. And it was, you know, uh, gold for his career at the time. Um, I am really surprised that the church allowed Laura Prepon to be, I hope I'm saying her last name right. I don't know, Prepon, Prepper, Prepon. Um, anyway, I don't, I'm surprised that they allowed her to play a uh, lesbian on Orange is New Black for what, seven seasons, whatever? This is the last season they're on. Um, because that's very, very no-no in Scientology. Uh, they are not LGBT friendly. So that was interesting, but they, you know, they allowed her to do it. The only time I know for absolutely sure, and of course we all know this, that the church stepped in and told one of its celebrities that it absolutely positively had to stop doing what it's doing is Isaac Hayes, when, they, when he had to stop being chef on South Park after the uh, Trapped in the Closet episode where it was Trey and Matt ridicule Scientology and Tom Cruise. That was a line that Scientology was not at all uh, going to go on, and then they were not going to let Isaac Hayes continue as a Scientologist in good standing on that show when they felt that Trey and Matt were completely suppressive, and, uh, and that was their, their thinking and logic on that. Isaac Hayes was not happy about having to let go of that show or, or leave it, but he did, and that's, you know, because that's what cult members do when their cult tells them to do something. So that's what I can say about that. As far as the mental gymnastics, um, you know, it would really just be a matter of showing them various issues from L. Ron Hubbard. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's an office in the Celebrity Center International called the President's Office, and they're the ones who deal with all the celebrities. So they would call the celebrity in and, and sit them down and probably go over various Hubbard issues and say, you know, you're going to go do this role, but it's going to, you know, it's, it's, the church is okay with somebody playing a bad guy or playing a dick or something, right? Or being the, you know, that's, that's, that, they don't have any problem with that. I'll tell you an example of where the church would step in and probably put a, put a quash on the whole thing would be if a Scientology celebrity were considering taking a role in a movie about Scientology, where they were going to play a Sea Org member or something, right? Or they were going to, you know, something like that. Something that was directly online of being critical of the Church of Scientology itself. That's where they would, that's where they would go, nope, line in the sand, you're not crossing it. If you're going to continue to be a Scientologist, you are not going to do this role, right? And, uh, and they would just, you know, use their standard ethics and Hubbard issues and whatnot and, uh, and handle the person to, to not do that. And it wouldn't really be that hard. <laughs> you know, uh, so that's how that would go down. Mark P. At various times, you have commented about Star Wars, Star Trek, and other movies. You said you enjoyed reading fantasy, and I'm guessing movies as well. I've also heard you use the word grok a few times, so are you a Heinlein fan as well? What are your favorite hardcore sci-fi authors? Thanks for the question, Mark. I haven't read sci-fi in a very, very long time. It's not really my preferred genre. But I went and looked up some of the hard sci-fi authors out there, and I was, I was a little bit of a list of people who I've read in the past who I really, really liked, and I would highly recommend to anybody. And these are, um, I've made a little list here I'm going to look at as I'm, as I'm telling you about this. There's a guy named James S.A. Corey, who's actually a pen name for two authors, uh, Daniel Abraham and Ty Frank, and they have written... Um, uh, a, a series of books which are which were made into a TV show. I haven't read the books. I've watched the TV show, and the show is called The Expanse. It's on Sci-Fi, and I think they've done two or three seasons of it. Brilliant show. Wonder. I love that show. I, again, I haven't watched the last season, but I watched the first two, and uh, so I really like the storyline, and I like everything connected with that. Arthur C. Clarke because the guy was just brilliant. Uh, Ray Bradbury for the exact same reasons. Um, and also, though, my favorite Ray Bradbury story is actually uh, Something Wicked This Way Comes, which is not, you know, hard sci-fi at all, but it's definitely my favorite Bradbury story. I love the title. I just love, I, I really like clever alliteration and clever use of words and, you know, and, and that title, Something Wicked This Way Comes, I just, ugh, I just, I just love that title. Uh, and it's a good story. Frank Herbert for Dune. I did not like any of the other Dune series books. I thought it went pretty, pretty quickly off the rails, but I did like Dune itself. Um, Philip K. Dick, 
who has written some brilliant short stories. I've read Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep and other works of his, and I've always been impressed. He's a very deep thinker and a good storyteller. Uh, Andy Weir. Okay, now he wrote The Martian, but he also wrote a very, very short story. I mean, it's literally a page long called The Egg. And I highly recommend you check it out because if you want an original take on the afterlife, the egg is the story for you. I've never seen anybody even approximate the concept that uh, Andy came up with for that story, and I thought it was just a little little gem of genius. And then there's William Gibson, who is uh, kind of responsible for cyberpunk as a genre. Uh, he wrote Neuromancer and uh, Mona Lisa Overdrive and, and uh, you know, a ton of other stories and short stories, and they were not exactly the most well-written stories. They were, some of them were damn confusing to read. But the concepts were so good and so interesting, and the way he was extrapolating where society was going with technology and computers was, was quite, quite on, the, on the money in many, many ways, and I was always impressed by his, his thinking. So, uh, so those are some authors I would recommend that I have enjoyed in the past on sci-fi. Whoa, okay, it's time for Flash Answers. Dequia D. Did LRH ever go up by Lafayette, or did anyone ever call him Lafayette? Or was this automatically an RPF sentence? Seems Lafayette may have more credibility leading a religion than Ron. I don't think Hubbard really enjoyed the name Lafayette. He was always L. Ron Hubbard from a very young age. I, I think he hated Lafayette as a name. I don't know, you know, which Lafayette he was named after, um, but, uh, but yeah, he, he didn't dig it. And uh, no one in Scientology calls him Lafayette. No one. I, I've never met anyone who called him that. It's always Ron or LRH or Hubbard. Travis, have you kept any material that you picked up along the way in Scientology, such as the books, cassette tapes, CDs, etc.? No, not really. I had to recreate my library digitally uh, for, uh, over the last many years as I've been uh, researching and studying Scientology outside of the church. Um, and so I didn't keep any of the stuff. Uh, I never, and I never really accumulated a very large collection of the materials when I was in. I had some lectures, some of the CDs, some of the books, but um, it wasn't really a thing for me because I was working for it and then I was in the Sea Org where I was surrounded by the materials all day, every day. So, you know, purchasing them seemed a little redundant, and also I just didn't have the money to do it. So um, I have been collecting some materials, especially recently I've been putting out a call for certain lectures and stuff from people I know, because I am looking for, um, you know, I am looking to put some, some things together uh, for research and reference purposes. So I'm, I'm on that now. Craig Duncan. With Scientology's views on members of the Sea Org having children, forced abortions, and now even worse, male vasectomies, how can David Miscavige have such a large family if he is the very top guy in the Sea Org? Surely he ought to follow the same rules that apply to all Sea Org members. I suspect you will say he is simply above the law slash rules imposed on everyone else, but how can he or others reconcile that? Craig, uh, David Miscavige does not have a large family. He has no family whatsoever in terms of children. He's never had any children. He has um, a brother, a twin sister, his father. I don't know. Maybe there's another brother in there that I don't, I'm not remembering right now. But that's his family, and all of them are out of Scientology. He is alone in his family in Scientology now. So uh, he's not breaking the rules at all. He doesn't ever intend on having kids as far as I know. And if he did, nobody would really bat an eye. Nobody would care. You know, the Sea Org members would. They'd be like, what the hell? But, uh, you know, they'd get over it, <laughs> you know, because that's what they do. So, you know, that's how that would go down. Okay, everybody, so that is our show for this week. Thanks very much for coming around and watching me uh, and my answers here. I hope you guys have a really, really special and wonderful Christmas or holiday season. Uh, for those of you who are not celebrating Christmas, um, happy Kwanzaa, happy Hanukkah, etc. And, uh, and I'll see you guys next week for our uh, New Year's episode. All right, talk to you later. Bye-bye.